Welcome back to Studio 10. So many veterans have stories that are never told. Maybe the emotional wounds were too deep. Maybe they were never asked. But every veteran has made sacrifices, and every veteran has a story. This morning on Studio 10, we are honored to share with you the story of Navy and Army veteran James Glisson. Mr. Glisson is now 88 years old and lives in Mobile with his wife. While serving during World War II, he directly helped in the capture of thousands of Japanese soldiers and also saved countless American lives. All right, this is uh, me and a buddy of mine. James Glisson's house contains a lifetime of memories. Now this picture of my wife when she was young here, she, when she hooked me, you know. Most of them happy. This is where my crew called a barracuda. But others, reminders of the tremendous sacrifices and hardships of World War II. I was crying and praying that I'd come back home alive because so many got killed every day. I know God saved my life. That life began in 1926 in Sneeds, Florida, and it wasn't an easy childhood. We was real poor, and uh, a lot of times they'd pick on me. You know, I, uh, I wore patched overalls, and uh, my mother would patch them, you know, and to wear to school, you know. In addition to being poor, Glisson was bullied for being Native American, and going home wasn't necessarily a refuge. I don't know how to explain it, but uh, it was a scuffle to live. We lived tough, you know, and my father thought that uh, he was raised up tough as an Indian, so he wanted uh, to raise us up tough too, you know. So at the age of 17, Glisson joined the Navy. His training took him from Solomon, Maryland to Portland, Oregon, and then the attack on Pearl Harbor. United States had officially entered the war. When I went to Pearl Harbor, the ships were still the uh, sunk ships and burnt ships and battleships and everything was lined up in Pearl Harbor. They were still there. Then orders came. Glisson was called to war. He was sent to Guadalcanal in the Pacific Ocean. The Japanese Navy outnumbered the U.S. and the battle was fierce. It went 24 hours a day. They never let up. They put one plane right after the other after you. And at night, it looked like the uh, stars from heaven had fall on you, so many bullets. As they neared Okinawa, planes began to attack. A ceasefire was ordered by the U.S. for fear of friendly fire, but Glisson saw a kamikaze plane scouting a U.S. communication ship. Men were about to die. Glisson took action. So when he got up over us, he turned his plane to the right to go sink it. And uh, when he did, uh, I shot him down. I shot the whole cockpit away, and he crashed into the ocean. Forty-five sailors survived because of James. But there was no time to celebrate. As they neared Hill 89 on Okinawa's south side, the sights were horrifying. I was, I was scared I was going to get killed because out on the ground looked like he'd mowed the wheat. They'd killed so many Americans, you know, they couldn't bury the dead. They fought hand in hand for weeks right there at uh, Hill 89. And uh, the, the Marines and Army were just covered the ground with the dead. But what came next was shocking. Hundreds of Japanese people jumping up and down in the water. James realized they weren't trying to fight. They were hungry, sick. They needed help. Despite reservations from other sailors, he took two Japanese on board, an image that was captured in the July 8, 1945 Nashville, Tennessean. This is the first two Japanese soldiers I, I captured. and. Uh, this one right here is the one that could speak uh, English good. He went to Tokyo University, and uh, that's a picture of me right there. Over the next days and weeks, the English-speaking Japanese and other translators helped James and U.S. forces capture approximately 80,000 Japanese men, women, and children, some who could have gone back to fight. Once again, James saved lives. 
This is a, when we started taking them in groups, you know, right here. These are all Japanese here, and it's taking them aboard. Somehow during all of this, James was able to build a life back home. He met his wife Lavelle in 1943 and for two years wrote her letters. When he returned, they were married December 31st, 1945. That marriage is blessed with five children, 15 grandchildren, and eight great-grandchildren. James has lived a happy life since the war, but he will never forget those who paid the ultimate sacrifice. It's been a long life to remember it all, you know. But uh, I can't forget all the little white crosses on all them islands, you know, were boys that didn't get to come home, you know. And there was plenty of them, you know. On every island, there's plenty of little white crosses still over there, you know. So that's the sad part. I have nightmares sometimes thinking about that. I'm lucky that I, uh, I got to come home, you know. So a couple of things. After serving in the Navy, work was scarce when he came home, so James also signed up and served in the Army for several years. He was almost called to fight in the Korean War, but because of his family and children, they did not send him overseas. Now, additionally, for all of his heroic acts and all the lives he saved, he's never received any special medals or honors. Some of his friends have written state leaders asking for Glisten to be recognized with the Silver Star Medal. It honors those like James for gallantry in action against an enemy of the United States. Hopefully he'll receive it because he's definitely earned it. Thank you, James Glisten, and thank you to all the veterans who have served our great country.